the most exciting thing to be doing is doing deals and investing in businesses and helping grow teams. Do you personally, do you experience that as predominantly stress or excitement? A sort of clear message we had back was, go and do some deals, guys. You know, we, we'd love to back you. Um, don't spend 18 months on the road trying to raise a fund. I feel like... <laughs> I don't want to know. I feel like it's my ability to praise this is probably somewhat hampered by the fact that you've named your entire PE firm after it. And that hurt because we'd worked incredibly hard on it. Um, and it, you know, made me realise you, you don't want a handshake, you need a piece of paper signed in blood. Welcome to Life of a Dealmaker, the Mayor Brown private equity podcast in which we talk to senior members of the private equity community about their career highlights, lowlights, investment thesis, and everything in between. We hope you enjoy it. Richard, thank you for joining me on the inaugural edition of Life of a Dealmaker. How do you feel about being Mayor Brown Private Equity's guinea pig in our launch into the podcast world? Fantastic. It's great to be first. Always good to be first in private equity. Um, so I thought it'd be good to start at the top. And by the top, I don't mean the start, but I thought maybe a more interesting window into your career journey would be if you take us to the moment which you consider to be the highlight so whether that's a particular moment or a phase that you really look back on and think, when I assess my career, that's the one which I find most rewarding. Where where would that be? I guess that would probably be our first deal as a Verna, uh, Climate Care, uh, which obviously we worked on together. And having been on that journey of setting the firm up identifying the sector, finding that business and working on it for 12 months through COVID uh, to get it done. That was a that was an incredible journey, actually. Incredibly hard work, probably the hardest I've worked in in a while. Um, and I think people around us, um, what, what surprised me is how much help we got, actually from people in the industry, former colleagues, all wanted to see us succeed. Yeah. And that, that really made a difference, but it kept us going because it was, as you know, uh, quite a journey. And when you talk about those people who helped you, presumably at the juncture at which you felt you were in a position where going alone um, and trying to start something new, that those relationships were there, did it surprise you? If you were to have written on a piece of paper before you started the firm, these are the people I can expect a good level of assistance from. Mm -hmm. How would that look if you compared it to actually what happened in Interesting. Practice? I think we were positively surprised, actually, um, by how much help we got from former colleagues, uh, from people who arguably are in competing firms yeah. who wanted to support us. But maybe the the one thing that both Stephen and I had the benefit of is good relationships with our, our previous firm. So we were, as you know, we were both at Apex together. Yeah. Um, Stephen was at Bridgepoint, I was at Exponent, and we had their support, and that was great. So when we went calling on potential investors, we had, we had their support, we had their backing, um, and we had their interest and attention, and that was, that was incredibly valuable. I guess, you know, the second thing is getting... Um, getting a transaction done when you are not only negotiating it, but also raising the equity and the debt at the same time yeah. um, is pretty hectic. And obviously there's there's Stephen and myself and Pierre, uh, who Pierre who hadn't been through a, a private equity deal before, Stephen and I have had, um, but even we underestimated how much help we needed. Unfortunately, you know, we got it. So yeah, I, I was surpri positively surprised. Yeah. And can you, can you pinpoint a moment in time where, because presumably 
to be to get yourself in a position ultimately whereby you've you've created your own brand your mm-hmm. first time manager um you've done that with Stephen presumably that genesis the idea in your mind of wanting to do that began a long time before you actually then went ahead and did it yes so can you pinpoint a, a moment in time where you thought that's the trigger that's the starting block for now we're going to go ahead and and press the button um i think i i think you know having been in private equity for 25 years the most exciting thing to be doing is doing deals and investing in businesses and helping grow teams and so there's only there's only so long you can go without wanting to get something done and i think both steven and i felt we still had um you know some we, we still felt that we wanted to invest and help grow businesses and the firms that we'd been at which we'd really enjoyed because they were successful had got bigger and bigger uh and you end up you know raising more funds and doing ever bigger transactions and we like we wanted to go back to the the kind of core middle market of businesses where um you know they need a lot of work incomplete yeah. management teams perhaps founder owned the need of professionalization the skill set we could bring in terms of helping them develop and and through you know M&A activity i think you know we we both still found that you know and do find it interesting and so is there a point i think you know steven um had a quite a long non compete to serve out from bridgepoint so we had to wait yeah uh, but then he was through that in 2019 and that was our opportunity we didn't know we were we were we were sort of starting out with covid coming down the <laughs> yeah. the track um yeah. but i think in you know in retrospect there probably wasn't one moment it was just a a sort of desire to keep investing and um you know and and keep in this market because we find it so interesting and when and this is something i i find particularly fascinating but when you so you get to the point where you decided to form averna capital what's the immediate focus area what are the i'm sure you know there's lots of things you have to think about in parallel when you're trying to raise the brand um but what's the where where do you start when you have that blank piece of paper you sit in a room with Steven and you think about creating a product yeah well i i i mean i think we started we started with the relationship that we have uh between Steven and i you know i've known Steven since 97 so that's 26 years that's longer than i've been married so i've known yeah, him a long well, time yeah and i think having worked together all those years ago and kept in touch we knew we could work together So number one, you know, are we a viable partnership? Do we have a complementary skill set? And the answer to that is yes. We you know, we are quite different. Uh I think we bring different attributes um to them and we have different weaknesses which hopefully we, you know, complement. So step one was could we work with each other? Yeah. Um and having known Stephen all that time and and you know, seen his journey and him having seen mine, you know, we felt confident about that. I think The second thing you do is you go and speak to investors you know because a, a firm is uh, a new firm is hard to to establish unless people believe that you can raise the capital. Yeah. And so having got our track records from Apex and Exponent and Bridgepoint we then went to see investors. And we didn't really have a fixed idea at that point what we were going to do. We were going to raise a fund, we were going to do some deal by deal. And the I guess the a sort of clear message we had back was go and do some deals guys you know we we'd love to back you um don't spend 18 months on the road trying to raise a fund because raising funds for first time managers uh, even though both of us have been in the industry 25 years is always takes a long time and so particularly in that time as well probably yeah yeah, yeah. i mean fundraising's never easy yeah. i think there are periods where it's incredibly difficult um and then it was and now it probably is too so that really encouraged us to go and go and find some interesting transactions and inevitably because of our networks we you know we had a few ideas uh, but then 
able to uh, develop those ideas and, and run at them with the confidence of being able to raise the money was, yeah, it was good. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, obviously is something I've done personally too, is move uh, firms with somebody else, so Electrica and a, a partner in our, in our private equity team. Um, so when you talk about the fact that you, you'd you realised or you'd worked on reaching a landing point that, that, that your skill sets were complementary, um, how would you characterise that what is it what where what do you think it is that differentiates the two of you and then likewise what is it that unites you such that building something together makes sense okay i think i i mean i guess first of all we are builders you know we want to build we want to build averno we want to build help build the businesses we invest in and you know, knowing that is true of each other is 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 really important because you know we're interested, we're curious, we are um, we're also ambitious, right? You know, it's 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 great going on that journey, helping build businesses and the effect it can have on on teams of people, uh, and we're particularly proud of the businesses we've invested in. Um, so, I think you know the having that desire is pretty important because. As you know, as you know, um, pursuing transactions, you know, it's a competitive market. You yeah. need to be dedicated. You need to prepare, be prepared to go the extra mile, um, you know, to win hearts and minds, to raise the capital, to, you know, get through the negotiation. Um, yeah, you, you, you've got to have the staying power to do that. I think we knew we were up for it, I guess. I think in terms of Stephen and I, you know, we come at things... In some ways, we developed a shorthand uh, for, you know, there's there's probably a bunch of things that we don't really need to discuss because we know we're kind of aligned on it. Yeah, so, it's, you know, even just a nod or a wing is like, okay, yeah, no, we know where we're coming from. But there's there are many things where Steam will have generally a very different perspective to me and where, you know, we create an environment where we can debate that with the rest of the team uh, and that's healthy. So I think... We knew we could, we were complementary and we can get things done. I think, you know, the other thing is um, we felt with our backgrounds that people would trust us with their money. Um, and so far, so good. Uh, but, you know, that's, that, that's a leap of faith because until you really, uh, you know, until you go out into the market to raise capital for a, for a you know, first deal or a first fund. Yeah. And, then say, right, we need you to sign the check and send the money. It's only then that you find out that you really do have their confidence. So you need to be sure of that. Yeah. Um, and in terms of, and so you said that you, you sometimes come at things from a from a different angle, but obviously not so different such that, you know, being co-founding partners of something together is would prove challenging. So is that something which, because the gap between when you're working at Apex together and forming Averna with no with no professional overlap in the interim, is that right? Yeah, so we worked together for eight years. Yeah. And then we have known each other, you know, since, uh, kept in touch. We, yeah, I, I guess that's right. We've we've um, been off doing our own deals. Um, Stephen obviously, you know, focused on more on financial services. I was focused more on business services, Exponent. Yeah, it's it's a. I guess there was a little bit of a leap of faith between us, but Stephen's somebody you know that I certainly uh, felt I can trust. I, I you know I can trust him entirely. Yeah, and he also has a heart of gold, which is sometimes people don't see that, but it it is true, and that's important. Yeah, and if you were to provide an assessment or a summary of, of where Averna Capital is today. Um, based on where you'd have expected it to be at the point in which you pull, pull the trigger, mm. how would you, how would it stack up? Well, is it, I mean, any plan we had for Averna is, you know, always out of date. Um, you know, we've grown the team a little bit. It's now four of us. Um, we're trying to make an investment every year um, and, you know, spend a lot of time on, the portfolio that we have, we're, we're fortunate with, you know, our first two transactions, 
will merge together. Um, and our third transaction is another platform, but all of those businesses and situations needed a lot of time. And we were fortunate because we don't have that large portfolio drag, yeah. which can absorb a huge amount of time. So we were able to, to give those businesses the time and attention they needed um, to help develop the teams. And so I think in honesty, the certainly in terms of the time commitment to the portfolio, it's much greater mm -hmm. at Averna than it ever was at Exponent or Apex. I mean, you know, a different level. But that's the nature of the you know the investments we have. And what you expected? And and maybe what I expected. Yeah. Yeah. Because we you know, we are we're focused on businesses that are on that growth journey of professionalization and inevitably until you've got the team fully formed um it's you know it's down to the sponsor to to fill those gaps yeah um and so i want to delve a little bit more now into your into your personal journey because i think what's interesting about it is there's obviously a great diversity there not just in terms of market segment which which might be which might be typical yeah. um but also different types of jobs completely particularly in the early the early phase so you you started out with an aerospace engineering job at Rolls Royce. I did, yeah. So I was I was sponsored actually through university. So before I went to university, I went and worked for Rolls Royce in Derby, and then every summer I went back there, um, doing a variety of placements through through my degree. And when I graduated, um, you know, I joined them. Uh, albeit I left quite quickly because. Even though, you know, when I started out, I thought I wanted to be an engineer. I think five years in Rolls-Royce on and off um, made me realize I was probably more ambitious than perhaps was easy to accommodate in a large corporate environment. Yeah. So things were fundamentally a bit slow moving. And so I decided to um, you know, chuck that all in and join um, LEK Consulting, which was, you know, going from one end of the spectrum to the other. Um, you know, at Rolls-Royce, it was, a, you know, quite an easy life, really, whereas LEK was 60, 70, 80 hour weeks um, working for a variety of different clients, but incre an increasing amount of private equity work. Yeah. So that got me interested, curious in the sector. Um, and I learned, you know, a huge amount in that time. And it's amazing, actually, working for a business like LEK Consulting, as it's now known. Um, the the friends I made during that initial period of my career, I'm, you know, still in touch with them all. Uh, I still see them uh, because, that, you know, it, it was an incredibly intense period. This is in the mid '90s, um, where you know we worked incredibly hard together. And we, if I think about it, we probably got five years work done in two. I mean, that's yeah. the nature of the business. Um, and so that, you know, got me interested in private equity because of the client base we had. And then the natural point from LEK is to go and do an MBA. So, you, you know, is it NCA, is it Harvard, is it Stanford, where are you going? And that was the point where I got the call from Apex. Um, and Stephen, who joined in at the start of 97, was growing the team there in the Bayek group. Uh, and I joined. I joined at the end of '97. So Apex at that point in time was very is very different to yes. So Apex at that point was a was a UK uh, mid market. Well, like, I mean, I guess the big market didn't really exist at yeah, that point. So yeah. it was UK mid market. It was a three hundred and twelve million pound fund, and we were doing a mix of early stage and growth buyout investments. So that's the business I joined. I was the twenty second investment professional at that point yeah um and it was you know it was an incredibly busy time this is um you know funds were invested very quickly so apex went on to raise you know i think the next fund was 1.8 billion and then 4 billion and then 5 billion and then 11 billion it just sort of exploded um and I, you know i had part of that journey uh, Stephen and i worked together on a number of deals uh, one of which Asima took me to Italy, so uh, the you know that that was an opportunity, quite an interesting one, where you know we'd invested. It was the first deal that that Apex had done in Italy, and Stephen and I worked on it together with Giancarlo uh, in the Milan office. And um, 
soon after we'd done it, I remember uh, the boss of Apex, Sir Ronald Cohen, saying, oh, have you thought about going to live in Milan and helping out with Azimut and helping grow the office? And I was like, oh, that's an interesting idea. And then I saw him again about six weeks later, and he said, when are you going? So it wasn't really a request. It was almost a <laughs> direction. So had two very interesting years in Milan. And that was, you know, it's a great time. You know, it's a great city to live in. Busy, busy, hard work, but good. Trying to grow a, a brand, you know, where we had the benefit of the mothership in London, but equally, you know, the private equity market in Italy was already well established. And so we were sort of a, a new entrant. But, um, yeah, you know, that was a great journey. Azimut, we ended up floating on the... As, that's the uh, is private jet business? No, it's a, it's a fund manager and distributor. So it's a financial okay. services business. Yeah, no, there is an Azimut yachts business. It's not yachts, that. Yeah. So it wasn't nearly as interesting. But, um, but we ended up floating that business in, in 2004. And then I came back to London. And so any reflections on doing business in Italy? I mean, I, I probably what you glean from that here at maybe out of date by now, but in terms of that's quite early in your career to have yeah. gone to another jurisdiction when still getting used to the process of doing deals in the UK and then and then going to them in another country. Is there anything you... Yeah, I think, I mean, I, interesting, because we were so active at Apex, I'd actually done quite a few deals before I went right. to Italy. Uh, you know, we were three or four deals a year I was involved in. So it was incredible, you know, big, steep learning curve. So by the time I, I got to Italy, I was probably quite experienced. Uh, we should probably write Ronald sent me. But um, yeah, Italy was a very different market. Uh, and we were very clear about the sorts of businesses we want to invest in and the sorts of people we wanted to partner with. And so that took some navigating, actually. Um, but, you know, the... The, I guess the, you know, the learning from that is when you move away from the mothership um, and then come back, uh, as I did in 2004, uh, yeah, it's hard, to keep, it's, hard, it's hard to keep your career on track. You know, you, you might have been busy, but you, you're away from, you know, all of the decision making. And so, you know, when I came back in 2004, I was like, okay, now the team is 150 people. Yeah. I'm just one of many whereas you know before i was probably one of far fewer and that that i think combined with having seen the business grow and having seen the way funds were being raised it was moving away from the smaller interesting transactions to much bigger transactions where it was about structuring where quite often we were partnered with somebody else and i found those situations much less interesting so that uh I, I shared that view with another colleague of mine, Richard Lanan, um, and together we ended up joining up with the guys from 3i to, to set up Exponent. So really it was to go back to where we'd started. Yeah. So having invested a 300 million, 313 million fund back in 98, um, we then went back to you know, create Exponent, which was a 400 million fund. So back to the mid-market. Yeah. And is there, is there anything you can... Um, point to which which uh, which explains that astronomic level of growth at, at Apex as a, as a kind of a percentage raise fund by fund that's huge, isn't it? The well, ones. yeah, great numbers. So they had some very successful transactions, some of which you know were, were really very very special. Um, I remember the, the fund that was raised and invested before I got there was UK Five, which had a business called Autonomy in it. And that uh, made something like 230 times its money and returned the fund four times or something. I mean, it's quite one deal. And so when you have really incredible performance like that, that, yeah. that really was the the, uh, the fire under the, the fundraising engine, which, you know, Ronald and, and colleagues were very good at. So that's, you know, they were able to go on that journey of really increasing assets under management. I think the team that I was in, the buyout group, was was sort of playing catch up because we, you know, we had to move quite quickly from investing 30, 40, 50 million to 200, 300, 400 million. Um, but then, so was the rest of the market at that point. And I think you know, you, you just have to, <laughs> you just have to make sure that the the transactions you're doing are, are, are significant in the context of a fund of that size. Yeah. 
And have you ever had a um, specific sector focus? I know I was, I was looking into your the directorships you've had, All right? Um, and obviously now I know that the yacht business is not <laughs> is not a yacht business, so we can take that one out. But there's still a lot of travel travel in there. Yeah, so I, I guess that's right. So um, you know the the train line, um, which was my first deal at Exponent, where we bought uh, what was really a call center. Um, we bought it out of uh, Richard Branson's Virgin Group. Um, we took that on the journey for the next nine years from a call center to an online business uh, to a, to a uh, mobile business and a mobile ticketing business. And, you know, that was, it was amazing, actually. I mean, when we bought that business, it was, it was selling about 400 million pounds of tickets. And when we sold it, it was three and a half billion. Incredible, the, the growth. But also, the, I guess the work required to scale a business was was substantial which is why we ended up yeah uh, holding it for so long but yeah so travel has travel's been a feature and i guess you know the um you know the other the other pieces uh, naturally i've ended up looking at things which have an engineering aspect um so the last the last transaction i was involved with at apex was hansen transmissions which made gearboxes for wind turbines and so and i didn't really I, th- I guess we only knew we were at the start of the sort of renewable growth phase at that time. That was a very successful deal. But um, yeah, I, I think I have, we were encouraged to focus um, at Apex. And so everybody ends up, you know, with a, with, a, with a sort of focus, which is a function of the deals that they've done. But I've always thought, actually, you've got to go where the opportunities are because you can spend a lot of time in a, in a certain sector and there's nothing. Or, yeah. or it's just the wrong moment in the cycle. And so, I'm, I, you know, we try it. I think, and that's a lesson I've taken to Exponent and also to, to, to Averna where, you know, you have to be flexible in terms of um, not, I guess, not boxing yourself in. Yeah. And so at Averna, where are you from a sector perspective? Well, we, I mean, we are very much focused on business services, um, financial services, and we will look at industrial and uh, energy transition-related services businesses. So we're we're kind of asset light. We've identified a number of sectors that we think will grow and have that have that background of market growth, which gives you flexibility actually to be able to um, you know grow. I guess. It's very difficult when the you know the winds change and the the market and the sector moves against you. We you know we saw that there were a few consumer transactions um, at Exponent that really you know struggled because post global financial crisis you know the world changed and and yeah. you know, the retail sector was absolutely pummeled and that's it's very difficult to navigate that. So I think what we've learned is, you know, look at the longer term drivers and, and try and invest in businesses where you believe, you know, there's a 10, 20 year future. And it also seems to be the, 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 the deals you, you happen, perhaps happen to have done to date have also had a degree of an impact yeah. angle. Is that, is that? Absolutely. So I think, I guess the other, the sort of other piece of the jigsaw and maybe, you know, lots lots of stories around investment strategies are always retrofitted to what you've done. But for us, because of our mix of investors, we have some institutions, we have some um, individuals, we have some family offices. Actually, you know, what the business does is really important to them uh, and the impact it has. And so we want to be proud of the businesses that we invest in and we help grow because, um, you know, we're only ever transient owners but um, that we see, you know, it's a sort of, are we going to, are we going to feel proud owning this? And if the answer is, if nobody's enthusiastic about it, I'm not sure, then yeah, yeah, we don't pursue it. At a moment which you found particularly challenging, again, we can have, we can have moment or we can have phase um, where across, a, across the entirety of your career, you thought at this point in time, I think, I need to, you know, something needs to change or this is, I feel particularly low or or anything which fits into that category. Wow. 
So many. Um, <laughs> I get uh, this, uh, this podcast. Yeah, this podcast. No, yeah. the I yeah, I guess there was a low point actually at Apex. Uh, must have been two thousand one, two thousand and two. We were working on um, the buyout of NCP, car parks business, big team working 24-7 to get this done. And we got to Friday. uh, We had a handshake of exclusivity. And on Monday morning, we found out that Simben had done the deal over the weekend. (laughs) And that hurt because we'd worked incredibly hard on it. Yeah. and it, you know, made me realise you, you don't want a handshake. You need a piece of paper signed in blood. Um, and I'd learned from that that actually, you know, we're because of the nature of those sorts of situations. It was a it, it kind of ended up because you, you know you worked so hard, and we thought we were there, and actually we were ultimately very disappointed that I didn't want to play that game too many times. Yeah. I wanted to make sure that, you know, we were dealing with trustworthy counterparties because, you know, for me, this, the vendor had zero integrity after that. You know, you've shaken hands and then you've gone and done a deal with someone else. Yeah. So I'm not interested in, uh, you know, in talking to you, frankly. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, that integrity point is really, really valuable. And so... I think what I learned is, you know, referencing and making sure, you know, you know your counterparty well is really important. So we, we spend a lot of time worrying away about that. And so if we come to, um, as we come towards the the end segment, um, there is there is just one more question I wanted to ask, I, I guess, about about Verna and about being a first-time manager. I mean, from from the outside looking in, it seems incredibly stressful um trying to when pursuing a deal by deal strategy trying to first of all find an asset you like secondly get the seller to want to sell to you and then and then finally the financing which you referred to before do you personally do you experience that as predominantly stress or <laughs> excitement because because from from where i sit i think that's it's both, but I'm all, I'm also happy that it's not me that it is it. So that's I'm just interested to know how you when you embark on that journey, what's the overriding emotion that you feel? Um, I mean, it is stressful, but it's also energizing um, because you sort of think this is really difficult. But then, if it was easy, everybody would do it, right? So yeah. it's yeah, it's it's incredibly challenging to bring all those things to the right point at the right time uh takes a lot of convincing as you know um but it does get easier i think doing the first deal as a as a sort of you know we're not a new manager of course we're old timers i guess to some degree but doing your first deal in under a new name really hard yeah um second one easier third one easier um but you know as with all these things you just never know until until you're trying to get the next transaction done because, yeah. you know, the markets change and conditions change and, you know, people do look obviously at the at the recent portfolio performance. So as long mm-hmm. as touch wood that stays healthy, then I think, you know, we're in a good situation. Yeah, I'm uh, sure it must have been phenomenally helpful that deal one went so successfully as, yeah. it, as it did. So, that, you know, that's a good, it, I think, it, I think uh, Vernon would have looked quite different had it <laughs> yeah. had the first deal been a disaster. So I guess, you know, message to spin out first-time managers is just make sure your first deal is really good. <laughs> yeah. When I first Googled a Verna, when we worked together for the first time, I think half, half a decade or so ago, we I saw that in Latin, there was a reference to it, meaning in Latin, queen of the underworld. Right. Which presumably is not no no the Averna yeah so so where how did you come up with the the name Averna so I, Averna is is a drink um, it's an Italian digestivo um, usually served at the end of a meal and with ice and Stephen and I had drunk a, a lot of it uh, particularly during our period of ownership with Azimut where we would. Um, 
every time I had a board meeting, usually you'd get together with the CEO of the business the night before and have dinner. And then we'd come back to the hotel and we'd work out what we were going to do. And that would be over a few Avernas. And uh, so when we set up Averna, we didn't know we were going to call it Averna. It was sort of Project Averna because that was a <laughs> yeah. thing that, you know, I'm, and uh, you know, people who know me well, uh, particularly my probably my exponent colleagues, know that I've been tipping Averna down there throughout for a long time. So that's synonymous with with me and, and to some degree with Stephen. So um, you know, that's the origin of the name, um, and I think also. It's quite interesting because it's a little story. Um, Averna Capital happened to be available as well. You know, most of the good names have already gone. So yeah. um, even though it was a project name for a while, it ended up being being the name of the firm. Well, it's yeah. certainly got a better ring to it than Lager Capital. Yeah, indeed. You know? indeed. Insert a Lager name here, <laughs> Capital. Yeah. Um, I think with that write-up, it would be remiss of us not to try it. So here's one we prepped earlier. Ah, well done. Thank you. We're having it. We're having it on the rocks rather than neat. Always, is that right? Yeah. Always have to serve it with ice. Con ghiaccio, as they say. Con, con ghiaccio. Cheers. Cheers. I feel like. <laughs> I was that. I know. Well, I feel like it's my ability to praise this <laughs> is probably somewhat hampered by the fact that you've named your entire P firm after it. Indeed. So, so I'm going to say that I think it's brilliant. Right. It's really important to me that you like it. Um, but it's, it is nice. I can see how it's. Okay. I drink a lot of this stuff. So. I, I I'll stop drinking there so that I don't end up thinking that I should set up a North <laughs> P <pea> firm. <laughs> Okay, um, so the final the final thing, um, I've obviously prepped you for this, but um, for the second guest on the podcast, um, this piece we are calling The Rollover. Right, nice. I'm like um, just going to leave a couple of seconds pause to appreciate the pun, the pun right that's gone Hold into on. that. Um, if you could just write a question, which will form part of the next podcast with the next founder of a PE firm, and um, we will ask them that question. I'm not going to tell you who it is, though. Okay. Perfect. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Let's put that in here for now so we don't lose it. Um, Richard, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for talking to me. Pleasure.